Can I talk a little? I mean, can I just share a little bit about? Yes, but uh, if you want to stand up under this mic, you can have everybody on the sure. you. Sure. Hi, everybody. Sorry I was late yeah. tonight. Um, can everybody hear me online? I hope so. Um, so uh, I, I'm just uh, having an incredible nostalgia moment tonight watching this podcast because, of course, I know about David Block and his involvement with Hugh and RTP, but what you probably don't know is that I was living in South Africa. I went there in 1983 uh, to do my master's at the University of the Vatrachon, which is where David is his base. He's obviously in the astronomy and physics department. I was in the medical school doing my uh, uh, degree in medical biochemistry at the time. And right there on campus, there was a planetarium and you could go there and you could watch a, you know, a show. And David Block was the guy who did it. And I remember my uh, very new uh, wife at the time, uh, and I went to see this show, and and David Block was an amazing guy. Like first of all, it, it was clear that he was a Messianic Jew, so he's a Jewish person who believes in Jesus, and but he would do these public uh, planetarium shows, and he would start waxing eloquent as you can just imagine him doing about something that he was showing the audience. And then right out of the blue, he'd go, hallelujah. <laughs> you know, this is a public sort of space show. And I remember thinking, wow, this guy's really on fire for the Lord. And then uh, in 1986, um, I was called by a friend of mine who was doing, she was doing her PhD in, in geology at Fitz University. Um, and she said, Don, you need to come in here. There's a guy coming from the States, his name is Hugh Ross, and he's a scientist and he, and he, and he loves God and you gotta come and hear him because he's, he's, you know, he's the kind of guy that you, you'd love to hear. And so I went to hear him speak and, I, and I'll never forget it. Um, I was sitting there and I, I, I don't remember who I was with, but I turned to him and I said, wow, you know, wouldn't it be cool to someday be involved with that guy and this ministry that he's launching. And Hugh was traveling around the world at that time, basically launching RTB, what has become RTB. So, um, so David Block, I, you know, I, I knew him way back then, and he has now um, really formalized his relationship with RTB. And as you heard on the podcast, he's going to be coming uh, to California and is going to be uh, basically a scholar in residence working with uh, all of the RTB team. So, Pretty exciting because he's, he's the real deal. And, uh, uh, you know, as you heard, the guys published some pretty astounding work. Um, but it, it, he's the whole package. You know, it's not just he's a great scientist. He also has great faith and he loves the Lord and he'll he cannot shut him up <laughs> about the gospel. He'll just, he's right in there. So anyway, that's how my life and his life and Hugh's life all kind of intersected all in the sort of mid to late 80s. Uh, when I was uh, living in South Africa, so uh, a lot of a lot of nostalgia from uh, watching this time. Anyway, that's enough. I just thought that right. you guys might find that interesting story. So, yeah, thank you. I'll be right back. Just Anyone go. have any questions or comments? It was interesting that it's in one. Scott, go to the end of this mic here. If I have everyone can hear you, I was online. It was interesting that in one of today's papers, uh, the Lower Star, there was a picture of the uh, the bridge in California that was totally covered in fog, and they were talking about the importance of fog. A lot of people thought that fog was a nuisance and all that kind of stuff, but it went on to to point out that fog was very important for all, for many many reasons that were outlined in the paper, and I was amazed how it correlate, correlated with with the talk that we had today about the dust in space, that it's also very important and has a very meaningful, um, meaningful uh, existence. Yeah, it's amazing. Hey, Bruno, it's Joe calling, or Joe speaking here from uh, Florida. I have a curious question to ask. Yeah. Has anyone, uh, part of uh, RTB seen an actual video from YouTube that actually has given the most, I would say, compelling depiction of the position of the earth as far as 
the uh, grandeur of the universe itself, as far as humanity has been able to actually depict by chance? I've not seen it. Uh, I've seen it. Like, do you know who made it or anything? About it? Any more details about it? It's actually a very compelling video. Um, I know that I have shared it with the uh, King. I'm not sure if Robert's seen it at all. Um, because being that uh, we're all it's kind of a small circle of friends between here in the States as well as up in Canada itself, but it does give a very grandeur depiction showing um, the grandeur of actual as far as this humanity has been able to depict the, the mass size of the universe itself, as far as the galaxy with it, which in the solar system that we at least understand beyond our solar system, the, the multiple of actual galaxies and beyond that, as far as known by humanity that has been able to at least understand theoretically, to be able to be more accurate about this, how massive um, the universe the universe actually is, and as far as what um, the, the technology that we have, at least as far as twenty first century uh, technology we have available, um, shows how massive the actual universe actually is, and bigger than that to the point as far as our um, understanding is. Obviously, as far as God, universe, source, as I define it to be, extremely massive, that even outnumbers the sands on this planet that we reside on, that actually how huge or massive this universe actually is. I could actually share a link probably by email to you or to others in this group, to actually see this video because it's actually quite impressive and very well produced. So that way then you can actually see this and it explains the actual distance in a sense, just as a small segment or explanation as an example between the earth and our satellite moon. It actually is quite distant than uh, actually most humans even realize how far it is going at say like, um, I think it's like a hundred kilometers per hour to go from the earth to the moon. Just one small example. And then going from the earth to the sun itself is actually quite impressive. That's why I asked that question. Uh, I have not seen it. So send, send me the link. I'll take a look at the video. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, I'd be glad to because actually I've seen it more than once and it's gotten a lot of actual uh, traction on, online on YouTube. So I'll be glad to send right. it to you without a problem itself because it definitely will give us a new appreciation of truly how vast this universe actually is and how much bigger than we even understand. As far as I know that uh, even between those who actually are investing as well as trying to accomplish for from Earth to actually even travel to Mars, even in our own small little um, galaxy for lack of a better way of saying it. So, Joey, I, I have seen that video before. It's uh, there's some there's some uh, just some movies on uh, Netflix that have uh, shown that that similar uh, star field perspective. But I, I want to ask a question to the panel, the group here. I was going listening very carefully, so I'm not feeling that well, so I'm not going to put my camera on. I'm Robert, by the way. Um, I just so Hugh made a brilliant statement. He said, um, or David did. He said, um, our Creator sustains the universe by the power of His command. It, do I understand it properly? But when Dave was explaining about the infrared uh, pictures and views of the two uh, spiral galaxies, and I wrote them down in my notes, if you recall, the um, the um, you referred to the I believe it's the the M um, twenty eight and the um, uh, was it M eighty one and the the the, the GC um, G, uh, NGC 
309. Essentially, what I'm trying to ask here is, it seemed like there was some type of uh, interference about one one million light years ago, that or one million years ago. I can't remember which one, but the the almost as if God like commanded that that, that galaxy to kind of move away from the other one, like you know, almost almost intersected or interfered with. Um, I think it's the yeah, M31 and the M32. That's the ones. Uh, is that is that is that the understanding? And also, the second question is about the open open. Can they, can you need gentlemen just, just explain to us the cons the the glossary of terms like open, dynamic open system, uh, galaxies, and the the top down bottom up formation of stars. Sorry, I'm not an I'm not an astrophysicist. So I just just give us the Cole's notes on that for us, please, Don or one of the or uh, Bruno, please. I don't know about uh, top down and bottom up what exactly those mean, uh, but with the galaxy that you're referring to is the Andromeda galaxy, and apparently there used to be a smaller galaxy orbiting it, but I think the time was actually 30 million years ago where the small one collided with the Andromeda, and it completely changed the structure of the spirals. Instead of being like, you know two spiral arms like on uh, our, the Milky Way galaxy, it sort of split them in, into two separate rings. Uh, I don't know if you remember when he showed the, the infrared picture, it has two, two rings, one inside the other. And the, when you see it through the visible light, it looks like it has spirals. So uh, one star, I mean, one uh, galaxy, the smaller one, even though it's a lot smaller than the, than the Andromeda galaxy, which is big, it affected it uh, affected the whole orbit and the whole structure of the star. And as far as I understand that the old dynamically open system means that two, two uh, type galaxies are interacting with one another. It's not a close, it's not, they're not completely separate. They interact and, and collide with one another and change uh, the structure. Okay, I, I just want to understand, so, um, are you saying like an open system is galaxies, dynamic open system, is there closed dynamic or is there closed system galaxies as well? I think what David uh, Block was trying to say is that uh, astronomers did not know that they interact with one another. Now they do. Oh, I see. Uh, okay. So I think their idea of systems doesn't fit anymore. Don, you have a comment? Yeah, I mean, I add a little bit. So, um, Basically, with a with a closed system, keep in mind, remember in the 1960s, the way astronomers uh, and astrophysicists understood the universe is they understood it as a closed system. In other words, it has always existed and it always will exist. There's nothing that's going to throw it off balance. So it, the, the other term that was used was an oscillating universe. It might, it might expand a little bit, but then gravity will bring it all back again, and then it'll expand. And, and it's been doing this for eternity. That was the view of the universe. So the, the notion that the universe was open, meaning that it was expanding and getting bigger and bigger and bigger was, a, was the first major breakthrough uh, that occurred at the time. Then those astronomers who said, okay, well, fine, the universe is expanding, but it's still, if we look at the Hubble Deep Field, we go back in time, we see all these galaxies. And so those galaxies basically all popped into existence from the Big Bang, coalesced, and then have been, you know, getting older and older as time has gone on. What they, what they did not acknowledge, and, and that kind of was a poor man's oscillating universe, if you like, even though they, they, they couldn't deny the expansion of the universe, they still said, yeah, but it's kind of a static universe, and even in, in its expansion. What David Block did is he showed that, that there are dynamic systems happening in the universe that there's interactions that we can't, could not even see in the visible realm, but have been revealed by the infrared realm that now help us to understand that these interactions are vital for the universe to be the way it is, which is the whole point of your question, I think, Robert, and that is, you know, I don't know if God commands that these things all actually happen when they happen, but the point that Hugh was making is that God is still involved in his universe. David said it at one point in the video when he said, God did not just make a mechanical universe, wind it up and then let it run. He is intimately involved with his creation still today, 
on the grand scale and on the small scale. Does that help? Yeah, that really helps a lot, uh, Brother Don. I really appreciate that because what, what Hugh and, and, and Dave also started the dialogue about is the redemptive and restorative qualities of God, which we experience ourselves in salvation and redemption and like also when the, the Lord molds and makes us into new vessels. And it seems as if he almost, uh, as the Lord inter inter intersects or interacts with uh, the cosmo cosmological aspects of our universe in that way too that's that seems to me what he's hinting at with this analogy and you're right bruno it is the actual drama of the galaxy and it's the m m31 m32 analysis that happened basically a million or 30 million light years ago that's what i'm referring to it's the same thing what we're talking about yeah thanks brothers i really appreciate that that's that's very helpful i think that the, you know there's a tendency if we if we look at the universe and go that it just it just is and it's just doing its own thing, the, the tendency is to to adopt you know what we call a dualistic view of God, which is that God, you know, yeah, he created the universe and yes, he did it, you know, all for us, and yes, he sent Jesus and he redeemed us, but you know, ever since then he's been like on holiday, you know, God's not involved with us, he's not dynamically engaged in our lives. And I know a lot of Christians including a period in my own life where I kind of went through thinking about God that way. And that is not the way God is at all. He is involved in our lives. And we can see that in this huge universe, we can see his involvement. And David is just one researcher of many that have given us some sort of insights into that. But, but when we start talking about our own personal testimonies and things, and we, and we can start to declare the things that God has done for us as individuals, in our lives, we begin to see that yes, God is involved. He's involved at every level, and uh, that's what makes Him wonderful, right? Um, just by the way, we were up at the cottage uh, closing up uh, last weekend, and uh, we went down and we lay on the dock one night at about ten thirty. And I don't know if you guys are aware, but we've had this astronomical event with Jupiter being really bright in the evening sky. How many people have seen it? Yeah. So it's a one in, so this will not happen again for 107 years. So it's a, and it's, and it has not happened for 75 years. So it's been 75 years since this last happened and it'll be 107 years before it happens again. And what happened is, is that Jupiter is very, very close to the earth in terms of its orbit with relative to the earth, but it's also happens to be in just the right position so that the sun's rays come from behind the earth, hit Jupiter and bounce back to us on earth. And it is the brightest object in the sky by far, like by far. And all you have to do is just look uh, in the east uh, tonight, I highly recommend it, <laughs> find an eastern sky, yeah, eastern sky and look up about here and you'll see a very bright object, that's Jupiter. And if you actually have, can get out of town of it and look slightly further up and to the right from Jupiter, you can see Saturn as well. Yeah. And if you have binoculars, you can actually see the, the rings. Mm -hmm. Good but good binoculars, you can actually see the rings of Saturn. That is a, also, it's just amazing time that this is all happening. And it won't happen again. It won't happen in your grandkids' lives either. So it's pretty cool. How do you know when you look up that that's Jupiter? How do you know? How do you know? Real simple. Your phone. Yeah. Okay. I've seen that. I use Skype. Yes. But yeah. you can look on any astronomical chart that's up to date. That's yeah. Suddenly. How much sure sure. people are aware of this app now that you can have on your phone? I don't know. It's called Skype. Yeah. It's called Skype. You also know it's Jupiter because if you notice where it is and then the next day you look at it again, it will have moved. If it's a star, it won't move. Yeah. Okay. And all questions. Who doesn't twinkle? The other night I was looking up and there are all kinds of bright objects. How do we know that they're not satellites? There are a lot of satellites, satellites to get to. Yeah. So when we were lying on the dock, again, we saw lots of satellites come over. Yeah. You can tell it's a satellite because it's moving quite mm -hmm. quickly. In fact, the International Space Station went over, right overhead while I was watching. That was really cool. Hmm. So, and that's something you find on the internet. When will the International Space Station be flying over my head, and, you know, where I am on the earth? And it'll, you just put it in where you are. And it says, oh, on this day, at this time, basically hmm. look here and you'll see the ISS. <clears throat> but here's the... Here's the here's the app. I don't know if you can see much of the back, but basically it's just you know I'm looking right now and it's telling me there's the moon. So the moon is right right there. 
because it lights up on my screen here as I go past that section of sky. And it tells me, uh, here's the constellation of uh, you know, Sagittarius. And if I keep coming around, there's Saturn right there. So Saturn's gonna be right up there. And if I keep coming around, there's Jupiter right there. Okay. Wow. So it's pretty cool. I mean, except me. What's the name of that act? Sky just view. download it. Sky just view. go download it. Sky view light. You don't so have to pay for it. Sky view light. You download it. Sky view. Sky view. Sky view. Right? Uh, sky view. Right? Uh, sky view. Right? Uh, point it up at the sky and it'll tell you. Yeah. No, I don't know. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So, that's pretty, you, like you can pay for the this actual version and gives you a little exactly. more, a lot more, you know, bells and whistles. So. Echo it's, and uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm gonna get you to find that on my phone. Okay. Okay. You just go to the App Store. Oh, oh, you, oh, you have go to the App Store. Type in Skyview Light. Okay. Bang! Download it. You're off to the races. <laughs> I ask a couple of um, sort of silly questions, but um, how fast is is our universe actually expanding? Uh, I don't know the exact number, but I have 900 billion. Is it roughly so, the speed of light? Not yet. Well, no, not yet. Not yet. No. And, and what's on the other side? Okay, the universe is here. It's expanding into what? Into what? That's a great question. Uh, you don't know? We, it's not. The edge of the universe, as we understand it, is where the space, time, energy, all those theorems tell us matter is being created. Matter, space itself is being created. So it's essentially God's voice from the beginning continuing to go out. We don't know what it's expanding into. It's expanding into nothing, really. There is no dimensions beyond that that we understand. So it's literally creating the dimensions of this universe as it expands. Does that make any sense at all? No. no I, I, I don't think it would. <laughs> oh, it does. I, should it's very key. <laughs> I know in the Goldilocks enigma, Paul Davies, one of the things that helped me to sort of enter into all this stuff was he said, stop imagining the Big Bang as seen from the outside. Right. He says, we're inside the Big yeah. Bang. So start imagining the Big Bang is all around you. Or he used the word everywhere. The Big Bang is everywhere. Yeah. So that's a, a beginning to help understand that. Um, another one for me is define nothing. You can't. You can't define nothing. If you said, well, it's it's the absence of anything where well, you said what it's not. Yeah. But to say what it is, you can't. And then the Bible, doesn't God sometimes refer to the abyss? So I think something along those lines, something. Yeah, I don't know if that's the same thing. I don't know either. Yeah. But we what we know from Hey Don, this is Joe from Tampa. I got asking a question here. Um there has actually been um, maybe more of a debate than maybe a conspiracy or even more of a this question. <clears throat> the theory has actually also been offered that the universe itself is actually a living, breathing, in a sense, system or being that expands and contracts kind of like our own living organism of our own bodies. And to kind of answer that question about how vast is it? Is it expanding further? Hard to be able to answer that question because the fact that unfortunately we do not have those answers to provide due to limitations of our technology as well as measurement aspects. If you can support this or even be able to give your own comment, Don, um, from your own research, you might be able to answer this quite well because the fact that the universe and its expansion as well as how far does it go is beyond human capacity because the fact we haven't reached that far to know having that lack of knowledge is not an ignorance it's just a lack of knowledge itself because the fact that we do not know we haven't expanded that far through our technology even through the satellites we've sent out i think only one that has gone farther enough to actually be able to answer that question itself because we haven't gathered that data or slash information to confirm 
is such an answer to a question of that nature? Well, I, I would disagree that we haven't got the instruments because tonight's whole podcast is essentially about an instrument that takes us back to almost the very beginning of time itself. So the, the Hubble Space Telescope got us back as far as about 380,000 380,000 years after the creation event, which is a blink in terms of the 14, 13.7 billion years that the universe uh, has existed. We know that because of the distances that we observe back in time using the Hubble. That's now been blown out of the water by the James Webb telescope, which is why it's such an exciting telescope because it's giving us 100 times the resolution of the Hubble. And so we can see a much more detail, exactly what Hubble saw, but we can also see further back in time. We, can, we cannot go all the way back to the creation event because even light itself could not escape from the energy and gravitation of the early universe as we understand, as astrophysicists understand it. So the idea that the universe is expanding is not, there's no question about that. Everywhere we look in the universe, the, the most distant galaxies that we look at are all red shifted, which means they are moved toward the red part of the spectrum because of their velocity and the fact that they are moving away from us. They are not moving toward us, they are moving away from us. And everywhere we look, not just one place or two places, but everywhere we look in the universe, all the most distant galaxies are red shifted. And this is how Hubble and Eddington discovered the expansion of the universe in the 1920s. And uh, it's also what changed uh, Albert Einstein's complete space time theorems and only time in his life that he admitted to making a mistake because he had introduced a fudge factor to basically make the universe an oscillating universe, as you just described. And after seeing through the Mount Palomar telescope in California, he said that he was wrong uh, because he could see for himself that the universe was expanding. Well, that's a bit of a long answer, but I tried to cover all the points you were making. Um, <clears throat> we have the instruments. When you say like a, something flying out of our solar system, that's, we don't need them. That doesn't tell us anything about the expansion of the universe. Um, what tells us the most about the expansion is the, is the telescopes that we have had, land-based telescopes, as well as now the Hubble and the James Webb, with the James Webb being literally orders and orders of magnitude more powerful. So anybody that says that the universe is, is an organism or is, a, is, is something that is, is oscillating meaning that it is collapsing in any in any in any sense and not expanding everywhere is misinformed and the expansion is actually increasing point and the rate of expansion is actually increasing correct thanks that's right i had to actually calculate this when i was in second year university how fast are those galaxies going based on the spectrum that we observe using a telescope and it's really easy it's a simple equation I wonder if it's a physical possibility that these more and more powerful telescopes will ever be able to see into the inflationary period? Well, everything's the inflationary period. It's been inflating ever since time well, that's, that's expansion. Yeah, okay. You mean the, the very early inflation part? Yeah, like... Well, like I said, it depends on how far back we can go before there just isn't even any light to observe. I read that in his book. He talks about it quite a bit. So I know you have too. There, will, there is a period where we won't be able to see. Not we'll be able to. Yeah, yeah, because of the nature of the universe at that time. Right. Not because our telescopes isn't good enough. It's because there's nothing to see. One of the mysteries is we know that the universe is 13.78 billion years old by looking in that direction, and we look back that far. But when we look the other way. It's the same. Right. So how did the universe get from over there to over there, which is double the distance? Right. So that's uh this is why this inflationary 
period had to come into part of the theory of, of expansion. Joy, what was the first um, sort of energy that was created? You know, I mean, in the Big Bang, you know, whatever <clears throat> God did it, but what what did He make first? Well, He made essentially pure yeah. energy <laughs> that eventually coalesced into the primitive matter that we understand right. as you know what makes up the physical universe so he made dimensions first of all so having dimensionality to the universe was part of that creation and then into that dimensionality uh he introduced uh, this phenomenal energy which expanded inflated and eventually cooled it was of such high energy that the temperature was you know almost to say to almost infinite and then it gradually cooled as it as it expanded and as it cooled uh, matter began to form light started to be able to escape because the the energy was such and the mass was such that even light could not escape from the gravitation of of that early event and that's why the 380,000 years is where they estimate that light started to you know be able to uh, to really get out of this massive gravitational um, uh, beginning of the of the universe and that's when we can start to see things because if you haven't got light or any kind of electromagnetic spectrum whether it's infrared ultraviolet it doesn't matter if it can't escape the gravity then you're not going to be able to see it well are electrons and, and protons and all, aren't they made from energy which is like electro um, magnetic energy which is like like light and all that so when when the light coalesces it's mm -hmm. held together because of the positive and negative forces of electricity and the, the two poles of the magnetism isn't that what holds the well, light light, together light is made of, light is, is has a dual nature, both a wave and a particle. Um, and it's made of photons. So they're separate from what makes up physical matter, which you're correct. Protons, neutrons, electrons is what essentially makes up the atomic structure of everything that we know. Those particles themselves are made up of subatomic particles like gluons and pi mesons and all kinds of things that they have discovered. Particle accelerators. So, at the end of the day, it really sounds weird to say this. Everything that we understand about the universe comes down to mathematics, because that's what it is at the very, very bottom level. It's it's mathematics. Hey Don, um, but don't we also have uh, a Voyager one uh, satellite that was launched back in '98 that does still collect data and transmits it back to Earth? aside from telescopes we have down here on earth itself that does transmit our data so we still do actually have a mobile satellite voyager one that was sent back over 20 years ago that does transmit still data to us though it's light years away according to nasa's actual launch of that wouldn't that be accurate yeah no that's for sure that's true and not just voyager one there's many many other satellites that are out there um in fact, I just read a book about I don't know how many there are. There's quite a few, more, way more than you'd imagine. Um, but those satellites are all exploring our solar system. They're not, they're not interested in or designed to answer the questions we're talking about tonight, which is universe-sized issues. So none of those um, satellites are, are equipped with instrumentation for example, that, that is designed to, to look at red shifts on, on galaxies or anything like that. They're, they're not doing that. They're more interested in flybys of, of Neptune, photographing Neptune, and um, doing uh, having a number of instruments on board that allows them to detect certain molecules in the atmosphere as they get close to Neptune. I'm just using Neptune as an example. Um, they can measure temperature, you know, pretty simple telemetry, actually, compared to the kinds of stuff we're talking about. So you're right, but they, they can't do what we're talking about. I think the farthest one 
is the Voyager one, and it's only it's only it just, just, it just passed Pluto a few years ago. That's right. It hasn't got so it's not even it just barely made it out of the solar system. That's right. And and uh, and they're all going to die because their energy sources are not. In fact, the James Webb Telescope. I'm sorry to tell you this, but it's going to die too <laughs> because it's. Uh, it's got yes, it's got a solar array, but it, it needs um, it needs a carbolic um, fuel, basically rocket fuel, to correct itself in space. So it's got these tiny little jets. You think about the you know the the Apollo lunar lander coming down and landing on the moon. You remember you see all those pictures, and it's got these you know four-way jets on each side well the, the space the james webb telescope has exactly the same thing more sophisticated of course but it uses this fuel that it took with it to 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 keep itself in space in the right orientation that's how it does it and then it powers all of its other stuff using the solar panels that it has which are huge sure but it can't move without these this fuel and well, eventually they'll probably send uh, a spatial update to refuel it. To refuel it. <laughs> they, they talked about that actually in the, in the article I read, but it's a long way away. So, um, yeah, that's a possibility. But basically, that fuel is designed to burn out and it's designed to be obsolete in, I think, about 25 years. I don't know. Something like that. I wonder how much of uh, the James Webb telescope is, is sort of all about finding other Earth-like planets? Like, is it more interested in looking back or is it looking for another Earth? Well, you know, I think it's a telescope that has, it, it is very powerful. It can do many things. It, it, the, its ability to look outside of the visible spectrum is pretty cool. Um, and it's too bad. I mean, David didn't <coughs> really show a lot of James Webb telescope pictures. He showed a lot of stuff that has been done by the Hubble which is fine and by the by the Spitzer telescope, but it's because it's it's such early days. Um, the, the, the photographs coming in from the James Webb are, are being trickled to, to the public. I'm sure there's some, some scientists somewhere that are that seen some stuff that's pretty amazing. But it's uh, it's uh, yeah, it can be used to look for because of its resolution, it can look at a distant star and it can see whether or not there's a planet transiting that star. And, and how big that planet is. Based on that, yeah, it can tell how big the planet is. It can tell whether it's in a stable orbit, how close the orbit, it can do all that stuff with a much greater level of resolution than what Hubble could do or any land based telescope. But I don't think it was sent up just to do that, that so much, one yeah. thing. No. <laughs> Most of the search for extraterrestrial life stuff is actually in the radio wavelengths mm. of telescopes. Mm. And those are all land, can be land based, earth based, and they are earth based. Um, so they're not affected by the atmosphere. It's only the, the, the shorter wavelengths of light that are more affected by the fact that we have. An atmosphere, hmm. right? So you want like ultraviolet or infrared, but as soon as you go way out, long, long, long wavelengths, the radio wavelengths, then then it's not hmm. as big a deal. On now, the handiwork any... of God, I'll go ahead, Jim. Yeah. Sorry. On the handiwork of God that they talked about tonight, if we look at it on the atomic level, I want to share a screen here on for gold. Let me just go there. Can you see that image? You're not sharing it, Jim. I, uh, or, or maybe it doesn't share. I, I need to make you a co-host share. Oh, okay. <laughs> Permit but, there, Bruno. <laughs> uh, we're sort of running a little bit late now. I don't know if you'd be want to end. And uh, yeah, so I know it's going on nine o'clock, but if you will allow. <laughs> Is it a point that someone wants to make? Yeah, I, I, it's just, if you look at uh, the atoms of gold, six gold atoms you can bring together an elaborate cross. And a friend of mine, Serge Stoyan, 
who is a physicist. He's down in the States now working on a big project. I haven't been able to get a hold of him. It must be pretty important. Um, I was just, he, he believes that if you were able to look at the whole universe, it would be this immense elaborate cross. It would just show the, um, the whole uh, meaning and purpose of man. And I thought it was kind of interesting that uh, the atoms of gold, when you, when you bring it together, forms this, this cross, a very elaborate cross. I've heard that before. Yeah. I've heard other claims made about all kinds of things that <laughs> let's just say can be easily disputed. And so we, we shouldn't be hanging our hat too much on that. No, no, I, I, I just want, we were talking about the, uh, you know, the handiwork of God. And uh, I just, um, I thought it was interesting um, how the atoms form this elaborate cross of gold atoms. Oh. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, let's, we're going to end here and we'll continue again next month uh, in person. So everyone, uh, I uh, try to make it out. If not, you'll see the video uh, about a week or two later. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Bruno. Yeah, thanks very much, Bruno, and I uh, appreciate it very much.